Hello, this is Canadian Independent Media. It's October 15th. This week, uh, creating divisions in Canada, pinkwashing, and California fires. First, why are our police, the media, and the government creating fear and division in Canada? The most important thing about this whole story is that it was a complete lie, put together by the RCMP, the Stephen Harper government, and the corporate media in order to cause problems and trouble within our society. For the second time in just two months, the RCMP have announced that they prevented a planned terror attack against Canadians. It was a Canada Day plot to take place during celebrations in BC. In July of 2013, we Canadians were told that a terror bombing had almost happened in Victoria, BC. Luckily for us, the RCMP were able to stop it and save many lives. But the judge, who later freed the two alleged terror bombers, said the entire plot was carried out by the RCMP and never would have happened if the RCMP had not made it happen. In other words, the whole story was phony. But here is what the RCMP chose to tell us instead. On July 1st, the RCMP arrested and charged John Stuart Nuttall and Amanda Cordy for terrorism-related activities, including taking steps to build and subsequently place explosive devices at a predetermined location in the city of Victoria in British Columbia for the purpose of causing death or serious bodily injuries on Canada Day. And here's a quote from Victoria's Daily Newspaper a day after the bombing. RCMP Commissioner James Malazia said the alleged terrorists were inspired by Al-Qaeda and were self-radicalized to violence. The newspaper then told us the two accused had converted to Islam and embraced the Muslim faith, but the offenses are unrelated to any mosque. You can see how neatly the words Islam and Muslims and mosques are tied together with the words terrorism and Al-Qaeda. And the RCMP and the Harper government let the media spread this message of hate and division, even though they knew it was all a lie. I think that we Canadians were the real targets of this entire affair. Our rulers want fear, anger, and division in our country, and this is how they create it. And so far, they've gotten away with it, and they have created fear and division. So instead of all of us fighting against the 1% of the 1% who are our common enemy, they have us fighting each other in the streets, which is exactly their plan. Back in 2013, when the BC legislature was bombed, the RCMP told us it was done by people who were Muslims. But as British Columbia Supreme Court Justice Catherine Bruce later said, the RCMP had completely manufactured the entire bombing. She said, this was not a situation in which the police were attempting to disrupt an ongoing criminal enterprise. Rather, the offenses committed by the defendants were brought about by the police. By any measure, she said, this was a clear case of police manufactured crime. And Judge Bruce concluded that the two people were manipulated by the RCMP into planting the bombs, something that would not have happened without the RCMP doing it. The day after the fake bombings, BC, BC Premier Christy Clark said this. What they wanted to accomplish was more than just to harm individuals on that day. What they want to do is the same thing that terrorists want to do all over the world, and that is rob us of our sense of security, to rob us of our sense that this place belongs to us. And we cannot allow them to succeed in that. Terrorists, she said, want to rob us of our sense of security. But when it's the national police force and our federal government creating a fake bombing to rob us of our sense of security 
and the media uses the fake story to pit us against each other, then we can see how truly bad things have become in Canada. We've got to stop our rulers from doing this kind of stuff to us. But instead, Justin Trudeau is now planning to appeal the judge's decision to free the two victims, and this case is scheduled to happen in January of 2018. Also, three weeks after the judge reamed out the RCMP for what they had done in British Columbia, it was deja vu all over again. And once more, away we go. The RCMP called it a race against time. A tip from the FBI first thing yesterday morning. One of those videos from ISIS sympathizers we've seen so many times. But this time, the target was Canada and the planned attack imminent. Aaron Driver was actually in a cab carrying explosives. The CBC's Katie Simpson begins our coverage tonight from Ottawa. Katie. Police keep repeating this situation could have been so much worse, Rosie, and they're thanking American security officials for a tip that stopped what appeared to be an impending attack here at home. And that's how they do it to us. It's October and time to wear the pink. Did you run for the cure? AstraZeneca, makers of two cancer drugs, wants women to learn more about their own breast health during their sponsoring of Breast Cancer Awareness Month repeating the word cure ad nauseum and avoiding the word carcinogen. But truth be told, October should be renamed Breast Cancer Unawareness Month, as it has nothing to do with generating awareness about the true causes and solution for the breast cancer epidemic and everything to do with making the public focus on a presumably non-existent cure to be produced through the pharmaceutical pipeline somewhere off in the future only after enough money is raised. Instead of identifying and addressing the known causes of cancer, like the many mammary carcinogens now identified in body care products, GMO foods, and processed foods, and our, included, uh, and our polluted environment, some by the very companies that display their pinked up logos this month, the mission of Breast Cancer Awareness Month is to make people think that the best way to prevent cancer is to detect it early. And how? By subjecting their breasts to radiation-based diagnostic screening that we now know actually causes breast cancer and which has led to over one million cases of falsely diagnosed and unnecessarily treated breast cancers in the past 30 years in the U.S. alone. Canadian author and researcher Alan Castles points out that for every life saved, 2,100 women every year must be screened, which brings up 690 false positives, requiring further screening and possible surgical intervention to prove non-malignancy. You can see his comments at the end of this video. Yet research studies, including large randomized trials on mammography, reported no significant reduction in breast cancer mortality. What's worse, a number of studies demonstrated that mammography increases total mortality. Breast cancer screening aimed at early detection with both traditional and non-traditional procedures is about diagnosis and subsequent treatment of a problem that has not been prevented. The Prevent Cancer organization is typically sparse in prevention advice. The corporate culture's self-interest and influence help to assure that the public's focus is predominantly centered around preventive breast screening tests rather than on true prevention. You're supposed to believe that diagnosis and treatment, not prevention, is a solution to beating breast cancer. The chief medical officer of the American Cancer Society, Otis Webb Brawley, MD, explained it in a plain language in 2012. He said, there is no money in prevention, unquote. Naturally, this epitomizes a situation highly profitable to the medical industry, but extremely costly to a society in terms of both fiscal resources and human suffering and lives lost. Some bad news from California. Uh, here's a quick update on a past story. California is using fracking wastewater to irrigate its food crops. 
including organic foods. This is a disaster, and personally, I no longer feel that good about buying food from California. It's kind of hard to believe that poisoned water is being used to irrigate the food we eat. And while that's being done, the Canadian government and our corporate media don't even bother telling us about it. It's kind of unbelievable. And still in California, it's Saturday, October the 14th, as I'm writing this, and California is ablaze. There are over 30 confirmed dead, hundreds missing, over 3,000 homes gone. It seems that maybe our planet's climate has now changed, and we're going to have to live with the horrible results of what we've done. In the last few months, we've seen devastation in Houston, Florida, and Puerto Rico, plus perhaps the driest summer on record in Saskatchewan, and the biggest forest fires ever in British Columbia. These are major disasters, and there were many more around the world as well. So the real question is, what are we going to do? You may have noticed that Mother Nature is getting angry. More than four feet of rain in Houston, huge hurricanes in Florida and the Caribbean, and now California on fire. And Mother Nature may be only beginning. What we are seeing is just a glimpse of her power. So how are we reacting? China is hopefully moving to end the use of gas-powered cars in the near future. Paris will ban all gas cars by 2030, they say. Germany is moving to renewables. This is not enough, but it is at least small steps in the right direction. It's unfortunately too late to prevent a major disaster but we still have to do what we can, and certainly no more of this. Our planet is telling us we have to slow down. Our way of life is unsustainable. We have to start to use less, less cars, less waste, less excess. That's what we have to do if we want to try to save our children's futures. And this is a good thing we have to do. So let's embrace it. Less can be more if we do it right. We can do better, and the time to start is definitely now. That's the news for this week. Thanks for watching Canadian Independent Media. Mammography screening, I don't know if you know, but mammography screening has undergone a huge rethink in the last few years, thankfully to some Canadian studies and, and, and some of uh, my colleagues in, in Toronto have, have done, you know, 20 year studies of the effects of mammography. Does everyone know what I mean by mammography? This is uh, screening in healthy women for breast cancer. Uh, it used to be that they said younger women should get screened. They don't quite say that anymore. Let me explain why. This is an advertisement from uh, Mother Jones magazine in 1990. It says, if you haven't had a mammogram, you need more than your breast examined, implying that the woman uh, who's 35 years old and has decides not to get a mammogram is something wrong with her head. Well, you know, we don't, so this is, this is, tw this is a 25 year old ad. We don't tell women 35 year years old to get a mammogram today. In fact, we don't tell 40-year-old women to get a mammogram. We say women 50 should consider it periodically. So why has that changed? Why has that changed over the years? And the, the, the two easy answers to that is that we've got better research, thanks to people like Peter Gotche and, and his colleagues in the Cochrane Collaboration, but we also understand the problem of overdiagnosis. And I'm going to explain to you what that means. And so the question is, you know, breast cancer screening is promoted as, done, as being done to save your life. Okay, well, how many people do you have to screen to save a life? It's a good question, isn't it? What about, what about that? There's a, there's, a, there, there, there's a picture that represents one in 80. Do you think that's reasonable, that you have to screen 80 women to find one breast cancer for which you can do something to prevent mortality. One in 80? You might say, well, you know, it is what it is. But I can tell you, when you look at the big studies, 
the long studies that are 20 years long, uh, it's not 1 in 80. And this is comparing screen populations against non-screen population. And the number that you have to screen, what, what do you think it is to save one life? If, if you've seen my, my, my TED talk, you will, you will know this answer, but no, it was, uh, it's uh, 2,100. So you have to screen, I don't know if you see the little red woman there, right in there. she's the one whose life was saved. Um, you have to screen 2,100 women every year for 10 years to save one life. That's an awful lot of screening. That's an awful lot of medical activity. And you know, you might say, well, what's wrong with that? You're going to save one life. It's the yield is low, but that one life could be your mother, your sister, your daughter, your friend. Is it worth it? Well, as you're doing that much screening on that large women, you are finding all kinds of things that will never go on to hurt people. There'll be calcifications, lumps, there'll be all kinds of um, things, that, anomalies that they find in breast tissue. And when you do that, you start the cascade of medical intervention. And so you have what we call false positives, which means they discover something, but they're not sure what it is. So they either have to do a biopsy or they have to do, any, uh, do more screening and more testing and so on. And some of those women will go on to have surgery and chemotherapy and, and, and you know, yada, yada. So how many false positives there would, be, would happen in the course of, of, of 10 years worth of screening mammography? Um, 690, okay? So to say that, so you've saved one life, but you've also caused about 690 women to have cancer scares and repeat testing and biopsies and further investigation and more screening and so on. 